Well, good morning, Gospel. Let's take some time this morning and, and be encouraged by the word to, um, even though we can't meet together in person, to, to virtually um, sing, sing along together in at least some way and to praise the Lord together. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness through every form, for sins they are mad. read um, from scripture and today we have psalm 42 so if you would turn there with me and we can read that together psalm 42 says as a deer pants for flowing streams so pants my soul for you O god my soul thirsts for god for the living god when shall i come and appear before god my tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead with them in procession to the house of God, with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him my salvation, and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is within me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forsaken me? 
Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Let's pray together. God, we long for you, and we want to long for you more. We want to be a people that that cannot wait to be joined together again in your presence and in the presence of your people. So please fuel in us a desire and a longing to, to want to be with your people, to want to be with you, and in, and, and in anticipation of what you have in store for us as your people. So in times of deep distress, and in times of deep pain and hurt, we ask that you would continuously fuel us with, with your reminders, with what you have in store for us. That in this time, even though it feels as if we are um, drowning in our sorrow, that we would be reminded of, of your goodness and of what we have in you. God, we confess that we don't always turn to you in times of need. That oftentimes we turn to our own strength. That in times of need, we think that we can pull ourselves up on our own. That we sometimes think that we don't need you. Other times we confess that we trust in in what you have given to us as good gifts, our material, what we have. Sometimes we trust in those things in times of need and in times of sorrow to take away the pain. Please forgive us of that, O oh Lord. And help us remember that, that in these times that it is only you who can save us, that, that when we rest in you, that you are our resting place, and that you are our goodness. So today we thank you for that fact. We thank you that we can come together Um, in at least some way, and remind one another of what you have done for us. The fact that you have not left us in our turmoil. That you have not left us in our strife, but that you have promised that through Christ that we can be reconciled back to you, that we can find your grace. So we thank you for that gift of grace that you have given us. And we ask that you would um, continually remind us of that and that we would find joy even in the midst of strife, that we can find our hope in your salvation, O God, that you are our God and that in you we find our refuge. We thank you and in all these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. Praise God for that. <clears throat> Today we find ourselves in James, picking up in our teaching series, looking at verses 5 through 8 this morning. You know, it's an understatement to say that we are living really in an unusual season, one that most of us have never experienced before. Who would have believed our reality really could shift so dramatically in such a short period of time? In the midst of all of this, the pastors of gospel are as hopeful uh, about the future of the church as we have ever been, maybe even more so. Peter reminds us that we as believers are to be preparing our minds for action. Literally, Peter says, pull your thoughts together. He says, pull in all the loose ends of your thinking. And it really is a good reminder for us in this season, as we experience the coronavirus, really to put our trust not in the world, 
but to focus our sure confidence in the mercy and grace of God. According to the health experts, as you have been watching, as I have been watching, we can expect things to get much worse probably in the coming days. Uh, COVID-19 will continue to spread and most likely will even have greater impact in Dark County. Some of us may even be infected by the virus and we don't know the outcome of it. But let us hold fast the confession of our hope and let us do that without wavering for he who promised is faithful. So we must remember in these times really to encourage each other and that we are made for so much more than this, that we have no lasting city, but we are to seek the city that is to come. We must remind each other that our hope is not in our financial outlook or our health or our comfort, but in Jesus, who is our sure and steadfast anchor of our soul. So our hope Our hope, your hope, is embodied in Jesus Christ. It's in him. It's nothing less. It's nothing more. Jesus is enough for us in this season. And so in these days, we want to be attentive. We want to be responsive. We want to be engaged. And so may our prayer be in the midst of this trial, Lord, have your way in us. James encourages us as we are going through trials, we know that they will happen. We know that we're in the midst of one right now. It's trying our patience. It's trying our our, our mental capacities. It's trying our uh, financial breath. It's, It's trying us in so many different ways. And so when we face a trial, we want to look to God. In fact, that's what James encourages us to do today. He says, trials are going to come and they're going to build steadfastness within you. And in the midst of that, you need help. And so what do we do in the midst of the trial? And so let's look together in James chapter one, looking at verses five through eight. James starts out saying, if any of you lack wisdom, if any of you lack wisdom about what? James is actually referring to the preceding verses in verses 1 through 4. James says, if you lack wisdom about your trial or tough time, there is hope. And so let's read this together. In James 1, beginning in verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith. With no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so there's four things that I want us to see throughout this passage as we just unpack it, verses, uh, each verse verses five through eight, just taking a moment to to unpack this and look at this together. And so the first thing I want you to see is that as God helps me through my trial, remember, as we learned last week, it's not that God takes you out of the trial. He's just with you through the trial. So as God helps me through my trial, I must admit that I don't have all the answers. And so as God helps me through my trial, I have to be quick to admit that I don't know it all. That that I don't have all the answers. He says there in verse 5, if any of you lack. Lack means to be without, to have need of something. The fact is, none of us have all the answers. Every person needs a special measure of understanding to help them through. And that need should drive you to ask God to give you that understanding, to give you that wisdom, to give you what you need in the midst of the trial. The implication of verse 5 is really clear. We're not there yet when it comes to wisdom. We need help. We are lacking something. And that something is wisdom, which is what we need when we walk through the trial. Like verse 2, verse 5 gives us an imperative. Let him ask God. This is what we're to do when we lack wisdom. We're to ask God. In relation to the wisdom of God, our own wisdom grows really through three different factors, knowledge, perspective, and experience. But we have limitations in all three of these areas in our life. 
And so when we walk through trials, we realize that we don't know all that is going on. We're not all knowing. We don't have all the knowledge. We don't see our situation from every angle. We don't have the perspective, the big perspective that we need as we go through the trial either. And we also oftentimes lack experience in what to do. So, so we don't have all the knowledge. We're, we don't know everything. We can't see the big perspective. And honestly, we don't have all the experience, meaning that we can't handle it on our own. We can't do it on our own. We must ask God. But God, on the other hand, he possesses all knowledge. He does have the eternal perspective. And in Christ, he really has experienced every kind of test. And he is the only one that has prevailed on his own. So when you and I face times of testing, whether that's physical or emotional or spiritual or, or moral, we need God's wisdom. So we see that there is an aspect of knowledge in wisdom, but it goes beyond knowledge. It's something that we cannot create or man manufacture on our own. Wisdom involves the practical use of that knowledge in dealing with life's issues, but only God can give you that. And so if you really want a, a definition, a simple one I think is this, that is that wisdom is the ability to view life really from God's perspective. And so we go to God because we need help with this life and God can see all of life. And so we're going to him for his divine intervention, his divine knowledge that he is willing to impart to you and I. It is the divine convergence of knowledge and experience which enables a person to make right choices that end up honoring God. God wants to give us practical discernment, but he expects us to ask. You have to ask. Wisdom begins really with a healthy fear, Proverbs 1, 7. It says healthy fear and respect for God. And so as you honor and esteem God, as you live in awe of his power, and as you are in his word, and as you're obeying his word, his wisdom really becomes your wisdom. It becomes my wisdom. It's yours as God becomes really the controlling influence in your life. So if you are respecting God, it means you're admitting that you are not a know-it-all. It means that you're submitting and surrendering because you know that you lack. You are needy. You are in need. And so you and I must admit that we don't have all the answers. The second thing we also see in verse 5, and it's this, as God helps us through our trials, I must ask for help. James 1, 5, if any of you lack wisdom, we know we lack, let him ask of God. Let him ask is an imperative. It's in the Greek. It's a verb, which means James is not giving us a, a nice little piece of advice. He is giving us a command. If you are in need, ask. You must ask. Do it. Therefore, as we go through our trials on a daily basis, we have no other option really but to ask God for wisdom and faith and strength and direction. But really, we know the kind of culture that we live in. We live in a culture that doesn't want just one option. In fact, we love to have many options. We love to take our pick. You, know, you have multiple paths to take. Which path is going to lead you where? And sometimes we want more than one option. But I can tell you, if you decide to go away from God in the midst of your trial, if you decide to go a different way than the wisdom that he gives you, he will not let you out of that trial. In fact, God many times allows you to stay in that trial until you learn the lesson that he's trying to teach you. He's trying to admonish you with. I think of Proverbs 2. Proverbs 2 verses 2 through 6 says, Making your ear attentive to wisdom, inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He says for you and I to make our ear attentive. We are to incline our heart. We're to kind of pull ourselves up to God, to sit, to be still, to know him to be in his word, to think it through and let God lean into you. Let God teach you what you need to learn. 
For the Lord is the one who gives wisdom. He says, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. See, we crave and we have this desire to know the right way. And God is saying, listen, what you and I must do as believers is simply ask. Pull yourself up to him. Sit before him. Submit and surrender underneath him. And listen. Listen to the heart of God striving to lead you in the right direction. So his way, John 14, 6, is the only way. His option is the only right option. The only option that you will truly be satisfied in. That's the way God created that craving. And so although God has wisdom in abundance, and he is infinitely more willing to impart his wisdom than we are to ask for it, he nevertheless expects us to ask for it. It is not something that the Lord will impress on an unwilling heart and mind. He wants your ear to be attentive. He wants your heart to incline to him. He wants you to come before him. And so ask for help. If you don't ask for help, if I don't ask for help, we will be lost. We will be confused. We will find ourselves in a place of despair. And so you and I must ask for help. The third thing we see is also in verse 5, and that's this. As God helps me through my trial, I must grow in his generosity. You see how he gives wisdom. He gives it generously. That is God's standard of giving to you. I mean, always God gives abundantly above what we could ask or think or even imagine. In fact, many times we realize God's grace and mercy. It's somewhat overwhelming because of the way that he lavishes it on us. He, he loves us so even in spite of our sin and, and in spite of, uh, of who we know we are, God's grace and mercy is very real. It's somewhat overwhelming. It's generous. That word generous literally means singleness of heart, that God has this singleness of heart towards you. It's also to do something unconditionally. It's to receive something without bargaining. Meaning God doesn't say you have to go fix everything and only then will he help you. The only condition that we find within this text is that you and I, as believers, we ask. We ask for it. When we simply come in our trials to God asking for his help and wisdom, he immediately and single-mindedly gives it to us generously. God is a generous God, and he gives to you. And notice also in verse 5, he gives to you without reproach. Reproach means to reprimand. James says that God gives generously to all without reproach, meaning God doesn't get on your case for, for you asking for wisdom. He loves the fact that we ask for wisdom. If you come asking for wisdom in a time of trial, in a a time of trouble, the Lord will never cast even the mildest rebuke on you. Isn't that an amazing thing? You know you, and yet the Father will not throw in your face how undeserving or unworthy you are, as obvious as that might be. You ask, he wants to give generously. Neither will he lecture you for not asking sooner. He understands that your spirit is willing, but that your flesh is weak. He knows your frame. He knows your situation. He knows the ins and outs of your trial, and he knows the motivation of your heart as you come to him and as you ask for wisdom, for his understanding, to glorify him in the midst of the trial. And so God giving to you, he wants to give it generously, He understands you. And so it's without hesitation. It's without reluctance or reservation that he gives you wisdom when you ask and he gives it generously. In essence, James is saying somewhat what the Psalm said in Psalm 81 verse 10. It's true for you and me. It says there, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. God is the one that wants you to come to him so that you might be filled by him. He's the one that brings you up through and out of the trial. It's in him. It's us relying on him. It's us having a genuine trust in him. And that's the fourth thing that we see. As you grow in God's generosity of wisdom towards you, it helps you with your trust in him. As God helps you through your trial, I must depend on him with genuine trust. 
Look at verse 6. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. James says, if you're going to ask, ask in faith. If you're asking in faith, that is that genuine trust and confidence in God. You're going to God and you're deciding that you're not going to doubt, that you're going to believe the promises, that you're going to believe what God has for you. Now, this isn't some kind of prosperity gospel. This is God being God. He says, come to him. He wants you to be satisfied in him. Now, it's not that you are satisfied so that you are more comfortable, so that life is more convenient, so that you have more stuff. That's none of it. The fact is, is that James was writing to uh, Jews who were dispersed outside of Jerusalem and, and they were suffering. They were going through difficulty. Now place yourself in the midst of that difficulty. Place yourself in your current trial. It's not about your prosperity. It's not about my prosperity. It's about God doing his work within our soul. And it's our genuine trust in him. Now let me ask you a question. Do you believe that God will give you wisdom if you ask for it? Do you believe that God will show uh, you the right path, that he will teach you the right steps to take, and that he will help you really learn wisdom? What we come to understand is that the faith that we put in God's promise will be the determining factor on how much wisdom we actually learn and actually how much wisdom we use in our life. It comes back to faith. It comes back to believe. It comes back to genuine trust. I mean, why would we ask if we're just going to doubt? Why would we ask and, and get a response from God only to not follow it? It's kind of pointless. It's actually worthless. In other words, you asking must be backed by genuine trust in God's character, in his purposes, in his promises. James says that we will get wisdom, but only if we ask in absolute faith that God will answer our prayer. Now, the opposite side of faith is doubt. And if we ask God with doubts and a lack of faith, then we will easily be persuaded that it might not happen. When we come asking with doubt, it's so easy for Satan just to jump in and and put down in your heart and mind. The world around you will quickly persuade you that the answer to your prayer is impossible. And that really, logically, it's not going to come to pass. It's not going to happen. God's not going to do it. But let's be honest for a moment. We all have days that we simply doubt that God will give us what we need. And we rationalize that doubt in so many different ways. It's easy for us to look a different direction. It's easy for us to strive to find our heart satisfaction in something else. You and I, sometimes we doubt because we believe that we're undeserving. And the truth is, We are undeserving, but God is gracious and kind. God's love is real. You are his sons and daughters called out for his purposes. Or sometimes you may think your your needs are not worthy of God's attention. But it's in his boundless grace and love that he chooses to take great interest in, in things that really in the grand scheme of things don't really seem to matter, but God takes interest in those things, in your things. Some of you might even try to argue with God, wondering why he allowed a certain trial to come into your life in the first place, or why he doesn't just provide a way out for you. It's easy for the world, the ways of the world. It's easy for our flesh. It's easy for sin to push out the word of God. You notice a a request that, that does not take God as word that doubts either really his ability or his trustworthiness really is worthless. We're reminded from the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 11 verse 6, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. The truth is, is that when we are drawing near to God, we are drawing near in faith. And he rewards those who draw near to him in faith, believing, believing his promises, trusting his promises. In verse 6, it says, But the believer that doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. It's this doubting request. 
It's one that does not believe it will be honored by God. And really, doubt is our own immaturity, which only drives us back and forth, really accomplishing nothing, gaining nothing, producing nothing. But when God is trusted, the outcome goes from bad to worse. Verse 7 gives you the outcome of your doubting. You can expect that you will not receive anything from the Lord. It says, for that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Verse 8 is clear. It's a clear definition of a doubter, someone who is double-minded and unstable in all their ways. And so this is you and I going through really a hard trial, but we turn to human resources rather than singularly trusting the Lord for answers and looking to the Lord for help. Double-minded means two-souled. Two-souled means that you want your way, but that you also want God's way. But the Bible reminds us that we cannot have both. Something else that happens many times in our own life is that we become bitter and resentful and we do not seek God's help at all. We don't renounce that. We, we, we do not renounce God, but many times we act as if God does not exist. We act as if God doesn't care or isn't capable of delivering us from our troubles. Maybe you know some of God's word and God's love and God's grace and, and God's providence, but you refuse to simply ask for wisdom. Your faith is troubled. Your heart is restless. Your mind is confused. Then you become indecisive, believing one moment and doubting the next, and it only leads to more instability. So really, verses 5 through 8, James says, don't be like this person. Are you in a trial? Have a genuine trust in God and ask for wisdom. So what are a couple takeaways? Three simple takeaways for our week as we look to God for wisdom. Number one, you need to pray for wisdom. James encourages us to ask for wisdom. How do you ask of God? You pray. Prayer acknowledges your dependence on God. And because you need God's divine perspective in everything in your life, you need to constantly be praying for wisdom. So this week, you need to pray for wisdom. Number two, you need to seek wisdom from the word. Wisdom is promised, but we know it must be sought after. I think back to Proverbs, make your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So make it a point in your life to seek wisdom from the word this week. Sit down every day with the word open, seeking God, seeking his word, seeking his understanding, seeking his knowledge, his perspective in the midst of your trial. Thirdly, you need to nurture wisdom. Wisdom is not permanent, and wisdom does not perpetuate itself. Wisdom must be sought after day after day. Your gift of God's wisdom is for today. Tomorrow, you and I must get up and seek God again for the wisdom that we need. So this week, what wisdom do you need in the midst of this trial that you're facing? And how are you going to get that wisdom? James encourages us to ask. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for today. And Lord, we hate the fact that we are physically separated from each other. It reminds us of the great need that you put within us to be with others, to have the church gathered a local body, worshiping, singing, reading the word, responding to the word together. And Lord, until the day where you reunite us, God, we continue to seek you. We continue to sit down before you. We continue to pray and to ask for wisdom and discernment in the midst of, uh, of the coronavirus, in the midst of decisions that we have to make as families. God, I pray that our hearts would long for you, that we would have a, a greater desire and affection for you, Lord. I pray in this season, Lord, where we find ourselves being still, Lord, that your word would flourish within our hearts and within our minds. God, that we would know you, that we would know your perspective. God, that we would see your way. And God, that we would be obedient 
to walk in it. God, we love you. May you be glorified in the midst of this trial. May you be honored. May you be drawing all people to yourself in the midst of the trial. May we truly see revival. Comforts have been stripped. Conveniences have been stripped. But we have all we need, Lord. We have you. God, may you be honored. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have a great week, gospel.